We get it right sometimes. This puny species of ours when we dream up a name for a place. And this one is perfect. In South Africa, the wild coast. Jagged cliffs tower over fickle seas. And untouched beaches shimmer in the sunlight. An African Eden, magnificent, unspoiled. But look at beauty and beware. Great white sharks prowl beneath violent storms that batter the rock-studded coast, whipping up waves so massive they swallow ships whole, spitting out their rusty hulls on nearby beaches. The wild coast is a nautical graveyard. There's a natural order of things, seems like there always has been, a rule to follow among souls in jeopardy of disaster at sea. Women and children first is the rule. It was born not 160 years ago off this very coast when a ship called the Birkenhead went down and 400 gallant men went with it so the women and children could use the few lifeboats available. The natural order, which was about to be broken on a modern cruiser off the very same coast. It was a glistening July day, midwinter in South Africa. In the port city of Durban, an aging cruise ship called the Oceanos was heading out to sea. This moment, the start of a seven-day sail from Durban to Cape Town and back again, with selected ports of call along the way. On deck were vacationers from around the country, camcorders running in happy anticipation. And to look back at this now, after it happened, knowing what terror these same lenses will soon record. Feels oddly like snooping. Here they are, smiling, alive, unafraid. There were, for example, Gerda Walton and her just-retired husband, George, keeping a long-ago promise to celebrate more than 30 years of happy marriage. He always said that he's going to take me again on a boat trip, and we were looking forward to it. Karen Winter was excited, too, She'd been on a cruise when she was a little girl, now married with two kids of her own. The chance for some time away with her husband was too good to pass up. Sometimes you have to escape from your children, right? Absolutely. And you know, your, your cruise, you know, it's always the best clothes, get out all the, the evening wear. And you were thinking it would be just like the one you were on when you were a little girl. Yes, I did. And at first, it was. The sun, the teeming buffet, the nightly stage shows, comedy. Music, magic. Robin Boltman was one of the magicians on board. So tell me about the kind of magic you do. I will show you one. I'll show you a little trick. Now to get a nut off anything. Yes. Hey, that's pretty good. But suddenly, the magic of the trip vanished. It was the halfway mark, the weather turned. A vacationer was filming as the Oceanos churned out of Cape Town through an ugly sea. You just couldn't believe the size of the waves. It was just very, very scary to watch. Then as it retraced its route back up the coast to Durban, the Oceanos heaved and lurched through massive swells. Some passengers with cabins on the lowest decks began to complain of a rancid sewage smell. It wasn't just a light odor? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. Lorraine Betts, the ship's cruise director, says she locked horns with the chief engineer. Fix it, she demanded. What kind of cruise director are you? I was a dragon, really, <laughs> really. Um, I was very young. You were not a shy, retiring, girly type. No, no. Her job? To see to the entertainment and well-being of the passengers and deal with the captain and staff of the ship. Put your hands together for Captain Yanis Evranis. But that latter task would not be easy on the Oceanos, as she learned when she introduced herself to the ship's Greek captain, Yanis Avranas. A little bird tonight told me that somebody would like to meet the captain. I put my hand out and I said, um, Captain Avranis, um, I'm Lorraine Betts, the uh, cruise director. Good afternoon. And uh, he looked up at me and he said, if you want to talk to me, you address me as God. God? Yes. So I did a sweeping bow, and I said, Good afternoon, God. I'm Lorraine Betts. <laughs> Near the end of the week-long cruise, the Oceanos plowed into the harbor at East London, not to wait out the weather, but to take on more than 100 additional passengers. 
A home video camera caught the ship at its berth as passengers made their way aboard for their final night at sea, 280 miles up the wild coast to Durban. The sky darkened. The wind scudded across the deck and whipped up whitecaps off the shore. And passenger Karen Winter's mother phoned. She'd had a premonition. My mother said to me, Karen, do not get back on the ship. I said, Ma, we're having a wonderful time. She said, I've watched the weather and the weather looks bad and I have a bad feeling. Please don't get back on. But anyhow, I, I didn't listen to her. Sandra Palmer was worried too. She and her husband were just joining the ship. One night at sea was a special surprise for Sandra's three small children, one a baby. But at the pier, the Oceanos was hardly the resplendent ship she'd imagined. What you expected was a big, shiny, yes, white ocean, ship. Yeah, ocean liner, a passenger vessel. The phrase her husband used was rusty tub. So let's go on and hope for the best. The Oceanos was due to sail at 4 p.m. The hour came and went as Captain Avranis watched the weather. It got worse. So now, a decision, sail tonight or wait out the wild coast storm. Around 5 p.m., the captain made his decision. The Oceanos headed out to sea. Compared with some of the cities at sea that ply the world's oceans, the Greek cruise ship Oceanos was a mere slip of a thing. She was less than half the length of the Queen Mary II, 500 feet from stem to stern, seven decks, two lounges, a dining room, and eight lifeboats. And now, as she steamed out of East London Harbor on an overnight sail up the coast of Durban, South Africa, she carried 571 living, breathing human beings, many of them rolling video cameras. Off the blustery coast, a vicious gale awaited but the captain had a schedule to keep. Proceed, he commanded. So how did everybody enjoy East London the last couple of days? Very nice. The entertainment began as the cruise got underway, a diversion as the Oceanos pitched and rolled as the roaring wind ripped the awning off the pool deck to hurtle into the sea. Mother of three, Sandra Palmer, sensed something was amiss when she and her family reached their cabin. We smelled sewage. Sewage? It was terrible. Yes, the cabin's absolutely reeked of sewage. Out at sea now, it was time for the captain's gala dinner. Cocktail dresses, suits and ties. Passenger Karen Winter struggled to keep the food from sliding off her table. We were all basically falling out of our chairs because it was rough. It was very rough. So, rocky, yes, but festive still. A last night of fun. Though some passengers staggered toward the lounge for the end of cruise show. And guitarist Moss Hill, seen here performing earlier that day, Though he'd played through plenty of storms, began to wonder, is it safe to go on? Some of the, the chairs had fallen over. They got a piano on stage that broke free, crashed into the drum kit and the whole lot on one side. And suddenly I thought, this is getting worrying now. Still, this was show business. No storm could shut them down. Then, 9.30 p.m., a passenger was filming the show. When, in a single moment, the Oceanos lost all power. I want you to imagine if you can. A long and the... Passenger Pete Neiman and his grown son Peter were in the lounge. It was a thud and, and the lights went out. Gerda Walton and her husband George were below decks in their cabin. I opened the door and the, here was this steward just taking out life jackets. And I said to him, what's going on? What's happening? And he said, lady, you better get upstairs quickly. In her office, cruise director Lorraine Betts could feel the ship was dead in the water. She grabbed her radio and rushed up seven flights to the bridge. And she was stunned when she came upon one of the senior officers. Here was this staff captain screaming into the emergency radio, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And he was going frantic. I felt myself get very calm. <laughs> and there was the captain. And I said, what's going on? And he, he just looked at me. It was like the lights were on and no one was home. Back down in the lounge, the emergency lights flickered on. A buzz of nerves went round the room, anxious looks. Guitarist Moss Hills and magician Robin Boltman took the stage to try to keep the passengers calm. We were singing songs, uh, keeping them happy. And then there were a few strange noises uh, above us. And one of the guys came in to me and he said, do you know that they're moving the lifeboats? 
over the side. Lifeboats? Now they were spooked. Around 10 p.m., Moss ran up to the bridge where he heard the startling news. The Oceanos had lost power in the engines, the captain said, and everybody would probably have to abandon ship. So I said, well, you know, are we sinking? No, we're definitely not sinking. We're just going to do it as a precaution. And I was thinking, well, it's the middle of the night in a very bad storm. OK, fine. I mean, you know, he's the captain. I'm a guitarist. You know, what do I know? Well, they waited for further instructions from the captain. Cruise director Lorraine Betts, she's the one in the green windbreaker, had the entertainers assemble all the passengers in the lounge and hand out life jackets. And then they waited and waited. I kept expecting something to happen. Maybe an officer in white will stride into the room and, and take charge and say, right, this is what's happening. But, but nothing happened. Moss, who doubled as the cruise videographer, wanted to know what was going on. His camera was with him as he went below to find out. As I was coming down the stairs, I could hear water. There in a stairwell, five floors down. The unthinkable. I'm right down below now. There's water everywhere. It looks like it's flowing in reasonably fast. It's sloshing about from side to side. I literally could not believe it. I now know we're in deep, deep trouble. So I guess we're going down. Why they were flooding, he did not know, but it was obvious. Sooner or later, this ship would sink. I went to my cabin, I shut the door, and my legs started shaking. I'd been in some situations, but I knew this was real. I knew it. And then Lorraine got hold of herself, and she says, ran back up to see the captain. I asked the captain a few times, how, how close are we to the shore? Here's the radar, can you show me? And nothing, nothing was coming from him. He just shut down. He shut down. It was, give or take, 11 p.m. Lorraine called together her staff, including magician Julian Butler, told them to quietly start moving women and children toward the ship's eight lifeboats. But to their surprise, some of the boats had already been commandeered by the ship's crew. Some of them had their jackets and suitcases and bags and everything. And I went to the staff captain and I said, what about passengers? And he said, bring ten. I said, that's all? Ten passengers in lifeboats designed to hold up to 99 souls. What did you think when you saw that? The word pathetic comes to mind. We've got a load of other passengers with us, women and children and all that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Get them on, get them on. And they're saying, no, we're full, we're full. Were they full? No, they weren't full, no. There was more than enough room to get everybody onto the lifeboats. The crew was aware, had to be, of a simple mathematical fact. If they left in half-empty lifeboats, there would not be room in the rest of the boats for all the passengers. Back inside the lounge, mother of three Sandra Palmer was shocked when the entertainers started ushering her and her children to the lifeboats. And I thought, oh wow, we're we going to actually get off the ship now. Well, where are we going to go to? Who's waiting outside for us? Reluctantly, she allowed herself to be led away from her husband, and she and the children stepped out on deck. The gale tore at them. The rain was freezing. In the wind and swell, the lifeboat was swinging away from the Oceanos, then crashing back against its side. Bewildered and terrified, Sandra watched as her two sons were shoved into the boat. I just thought, oh, there goes my kids, my boys already. They're there and you're on the ship? Yes. The 11-month-old Lisa was next. I remember somebody actually forcing, grabbing my baby out of my arms and throwing her to a lady in the lifeboat. Finally, Sandra managed to leap aboard herself and reclaim baby Lisa. And she and her children were lowered into the towering waves and swept out into the blackness of the storm. The Oceanos was in trouble, battered by a huge storm off the wild coast of South Africa, a place notorious for deadly sharks. It was now dead in the water, apparently sinking. At 11 p.m., a terrified Sandra Palmer climbed into a lifeboat with her two young sons and 11-month-old baby. And out in the dark, riding colossal swells, it only got worse. One minute we're down here, and then we're riding the crest of the wave. The sea at that stage was 15 meters high. 45-foot waves. Yes, yes. And then the people were starting to get sick, like really getting sick. In the boat, over the side, on one another, everybody. There was no dignity. They were just getting sick everywhere. 
Sandra clutched baby Lisa to her chest, shielding her from the wind and the waves. Then, to her horror, a breaking swell swept nine-year-old Jonathan into the sea. All I heard is saying, Mommy, 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 help me. Uh, save me, Mommy. And everybody was screaming, I was saying, please, somebody save my child. As her son floated away, a fellow passenger lunged once and then twice and then finally caught hold of a life jacket strap and hauled him back from certain death. By midnight back on the Oceanos, most of the officers had abandoned ship. Many crew, too. The first officer, the second officer, the third officer. Nobody's there. No officers. Not one. It was clear to guitarist Moss Hills that the fate of everyone still aboard rested on the shoulders of Lorraine Betts, her staff of entertainers, and the ordinary seamen who had stayed behind when senior officers left in the most seaworthy lifeboats. It was the cruise director, myself as the guitarist, and, and magician who seemed to be doing everything. Including the dismal business of separating frightened families. Magician Robin Boltman remembers husbands sending wives and children to an uncertain fate in the lifeboats. Well, they remained on ship, perhaps to drown. You can see the faces of the wife looking at him, him looking at her. Is this our last look, our last kiss goodbye? Inside the lounge, the remaining passengers, hundreds of them, confused and anxious now, huddled on the floor. And there, Gerda Walton's husband made a magnanimous and fateful decision. He and his wife would let others board the lifeboats first. I trusted him because I know he knows what's best for us, so I was quite happy to wait. Karen Winter was waiting in the lounge as well, where some of the entertainers tried to keep a sing-song going. The one woman was singing a bard with me and she was told to shut up. That's what they sang on the Titanic. That's right. Outside, 1.30 a.m., the last starboard lifeboat was away. The entertainers and cruise director led everybody to the port side where they began boarding the final three lifeboats and made an awful discovery. The ship was now heeling over so far that the lifeboats wouldn't slide down. They were just kind of stuck on the side of the ship. Then we realized, right, we've got no more lifeboats and we've got a couple of hundred people still left on board. Moss and magician Robin Boltman headed to the bridge to find the captain. But when they arrived... There was nobody up on the bridge. Just this voice on the radio saying, Oceana's coming, Oceana's coming. And the room is empty. Mm. Not a soul there. Not a soul. Robin, Lorraine, and Moss took turns sounding the SOS through the radio handset. A freighter came within range. Its captain hit them with a barrage of questions. You know, how many hours have got left to float? And I'd said to him, yeah, I don't know. He said, well, you know, try and estimate. And I said, well, I haven't, I can't, I've got no idea. And then he would say, well, you know, what rank are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm not actually a rank. I'm a guitarist. It's, it's the entertainment team are running the rescue. The captain, it turns out, was still on the ship. But according to Lorraine Betts, only because she and one of her staffers happened upon him as he tried to hop into a lifeboat with his dog. I said, Jardine, so we, we each took a grasp of a strap on his life jacket and held him back. Wouldn't let him and get in the And we pulled him to the side while the others continued going on. You know, you don't want to create a panic situation. Then we catch him twice more trying to get into other boats. Eventually, we take him back to the back deck and leave him there. And he stood there, holding onto the railing all night long. Over the radio, Lorraine and company learned that helicopter rescue squadrons had been summoned by the South African Defense Force. But the closest teams were still almost four hours away. It was just a matter of, will we still be around when the cavalry did arrive? Out on the water, three in the morning. Hours after Sandra Palmer's lifeboat was launched into the chaotic sea, the hull of a tanker loomed through the storm. Sailors high above on the ship's deck tossed down a harness. The passengers would have to be pulled up one by one. Her sons were among the first to go. I couldn't look. I was just down there praying, looking. Um, just tell me if my child is up there, sir. Baby Lisa was too small for the harness, so they tossed down a bucket. They actually ripped her out of my arms and they forced her into that little bucket. And they told her, pull. And as they're pulling her, it turned round like this, and it swung up against the side of the tanker. It was just like a loose leaf. Eventually, she got up there. I said, I can't believe it. With her children safe, it was at last Sandra's turn, and she was yanked aboard moments before her empty lifeboat sank into the sea. It was just that, wow, we're actually alive, we survived, we, we're here. 
Where is Daddy? Is Daddy? Where is Daddy? A question about her husband she could not answer. It was six in the morning off the wild coast of South Africa, and the Oceano's cruise ship had been sinking for eight hours. On a nearby tanker, a crewman turned his camera on the listing ship. The storm was mercifully breaking, but water was rising in the hull, pulling it down, deck by deck, into the deep. Most of the officers had abandoned ship in half-full lifeboats, leaving the fate of hundreds of passengers in the hands of cruise director Lorraine Betts and her team of entertainers. The captain was there, saying nothing, just standing mummified, holding on to that one railing near the pool deck. Can you help over? A camera recorded Robin Boltman, the ship's magician, on the bridge sounding the alarm. Uh, National Sea Rescue need a spare channel. Uh, we are channel 16. Rescue helicopters were headed their way, but there was no guarantee the Oceanus would still be afloat when they arrived. The ship was listing so badly, in fact. Lorraine decided to move the remaining passengers out from the lounge. When they walked out of that lounge, that's when it really clicked for them. Because they're walking up a steep hill. To oh, it was like that. Gerda Walton and her husband George lined up along the high side railing, hooking into fellow passengers so they wouldn't tumble down the deck. What did you two say to each other in that situation? We thought about our kids and the grandchildren that were still small, and we decided whatever happens, we'll do it together. If a ship goes down, we'll stay together. Then, off in the distance, first the sound, then the specks in the sky. The choppers were coming. To this day, I can never forget it. You could suddenly hear the noise of the choppers coming through, you know. What did that feel like? Like the cavalry coming over the hill. We're going to be saved. Hovering above the ship, 24-year-old Navy diver Paul Wiley prepared to drop onto the deck. His adrenaline was pumping. Then, the shock. I looked down and I saw hundreds of folks, you know, and I realized that there were literally hundreds of people on this vessel. In fact, almost 240 souls, and, for now, just two choppers. They came immediately very sad, because I knew for sure, 100% for sure, that we would not get all those people off that ship before it sunk. Getting Wiley and a fellow diver onto the deck was a near impossible task. The chopper was shaking in winds up to 70 miles an hour, and the boat was shifting wildly in 40-foot seas. But guitarist Moss Hills helped solve the problem by turning himself into an anchor. I found some rope on the deck, tied it around my waist, tied it around the railing, and was able to get my hands free and grab the legs of a diver as he swung past. Once on board, Wiley cased the ship. He could tell from the water pressure below decks. The Oceanos didn't have much time. For sure, that ship was sinking. I mean, there was no question. We were in serious, serious trouble. They would run two airlifts concurrently, one from the foredeck, one from the rear, each chopper pulling in about 20 survivors, then flying the three-mile trek to shore to unload and refuel. Wiley was relieved that nobody seemed to be panicking, but he'd only sent a handful of people to safety when a man in uniform approached, demanding to go next. Paul says he tried to ignore the man. There were women and children to save. But the man grabbed a harness and strapped himself in. I thought, well, it'll take more time to undo it and put it on someone else, and it's not worth worrying about it, so I just went off he went. That, Wiley later learned, had been Diana Savranis, the ship's captain, one of the first sent to safety in the airlift. As the operation picked up speed, Wiley realized he was going to need help. When he saw passenger Pete Neiman, he knew he'd found his man. He was as cool as you can imagine. And I thought, well, I don't know this guy's background or whatever, but I have to choose him. He's going to be the one. Pete and his son Peter, who'd been expecting an overnight party, had instead spent the night contemplating death at sea. Did you have any sense that you might be sitting in your own coffin? Yeah. Obviously, you know, you were thinking of things like that. Even so, they'd stepped aside when the airlift began so that others could go first. Paul Wiley came up to me and he said, listen, the two of us will get these people off. And I thought, OK, all right, well, here I am. I'm involved. Pete turned to his son. He wanted to send Peter in the next chopper. But Peter wouldn't hear of it. I said to him, son, but why don't you go? You've done your little bit. You can now go. So he said, Dad, I'm not leaving without you. On the foredeck, guitarist Moss Hills was enjoying some much-needed relief. But the airlift had only just gotten underway when the second Navy diver asked him to take over the lift. They gave me a very, very quick crash course on how to operate and the signals to, to give. And at first, it was seamless. But as the morning wore on, Moss, 
untrained and utterly exhausted, started to make mistakes. In one case, sending two elderly women careening into the ship's hull. The passengers started to scream as these two old ladies hit hard into the side of the ship like that. I then realized just the, the enormity of the responsibility. I might kill someone just trying to save them. By 9 a.m. on the rear deck, George and Gerda Walton were approaching the front of the line. Gerda had been apprehensive about the harness from the start. It was scary because, I mean, we'd, we, we'd never done something like that before, but you've got no option. Then diver Paul Wiley beckoned, and George and Gerda crawled over. Wiley struggled to get them into the double harness. He got the harness over me, and then he tried to put it around George's shoulder. It was quite a battle because he was shorter than George. Suddenly, the boat swayed to one side, prematurely tightening the line. The helicopter guy thought we were ready because he, they would that pull on signal, this. Yeah. yeah, that was a signal. So he lifted us, and as soon as he lifted us, I felt that George was very heavy. As they began to rise, Gerda could tell something was wrong. And then he said to me, I'm not in the harness, I'm going to fall down. So I said, you're not going to fall down now. I'll... You must go up with me. From the deck, Paul could see that George was starting to slide. The angle was such that neither the pilot nor the engineer in the chopper could tell what was going on beneath them. They were way up, you know, screaming to the chopper to bring them down, you know, and I realized, well, he's got no more strength, you know, he's going now, he's going to fall. George was now almost 200 feet above the ocean. Gerda threw her legs around her husband, trying desperately to hold on. It felt like a lifetime, but a little bit later he said to me, you, you'll have to let me go, because I won't make it up. And then I, I, I let him go. From a sinking ship in a South African gale, George Walton rose through the air toward a rescue helicopter, hanging on with all his strength to the love of his life. And then he could hold her no longer. He plummeted almost 200 feet to the Indian Ocean below. And far above, as they pulled her into the chopper, his desperate Gerda searched the void in vain for her George. I looked over the side and I tried to look through the little windows to see if I can see him. But I couldn't see him, they, and they airlifted me. They had so much to look forward to. George had just retired. They were going to travel, spend time with the kids, and now he was gone. Back on the Oceanus, the airlift was moving as fast as it possibly could. But cruise director Lorraine Betts, megaphone in hand, could tell they were still losing the battle with time. It was obvious that everybody was not going to make it in the helicopters. So I said, where's the other Navy guy? Show him the boats. Boats? No usable lifeboats at all, remember. But there were a few inflatable Zodiacs tucked away on the bow. Despite the conditions, magician Julian Butler and the second Navy diver were able to get one launched. So now passengers just had to jump in, and they would then be pulled into the Zodiac. But did they persuade passengers to jump into the freezing sea? Karen Winter had spent the long night in the lounge pondering what it would feel like to drown. Do you pass out first? Does your heart stop? Is there pain? You really thought you were going to yes, die? Yes, absolutely. Then, as Karen waited with her husband for their turn on the airlift, Lorraine Betts approached. She pointed to my husband and said, you now, you take that one, that one, that one, and that one, make your way to the front of the ship, and you get them to jump. Jump? That was not something Karen was willing to do. Besides, she'd cut her foot. It was bleeding. And this coastline was notorious for sharks. I had this bandage soaked full of blood, and I thought, you know, the... There are sharks um, in that Sharks. Water. Foot sharks smell. Ugh. Karen watched the surf crash over the bow, saw between swells the Navy divers circling in the dinghy below. Then her turn came to jump, and she couldn't. My husband said, you must go now. I said, I cannot do this. The ship is not sinking. I'd rather go in a helicopter. He said, no, 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 no. It is sinking. You have to jump. The only way to get Karen off the ship, he decided, was to jump first. And he just disappeared. He jumped. To this day, I just cannot believe that he actually left me there. And so now she took a breath and steeled herself and jumped into the sea. 
What was it like going into the water? It was freezing. She tried swimming away from the towering Yoshiyama, but each swell pinned her back against the hull. You try and swim, and you swim and swim and swim. A swell comes and pushes you back. And you look up, and here's this massive thing lying. Ready to suck you under. There you go. Then she heard an engine, and the arm of a Navy diver pulled her exhausted body into a dinghy. I thought, oh, this is wonderful. I'm safe. Karen and her husband were transferred to a lifeboat belonging to the Ned Lloyd Mauritius, a container ship that had responded to the Oceanos SOS call. But the only way to get onto the Ned Lloyd itself was to climb up onto the lifeboat's roof and be hoisted up with ropes. I thought, I don't believe this. I thought everything was great. Now I've got to do this. Karen managed to get to the roof, but the boat was tipping wildly from side to side in the surf. The crewman pleaded with her, get up. But Karen had shut down. I just said to the Filipino man that was really trying to help me, please just leave me, let me go, just leave me. You're ready to give up? Totally. I just couldn't take it anymore. It was just too much. Mm -mm. With the help of the crew, Karen Winter was saved. Did you happen to see the picture of yourself when you had just gotten on the Ned Lloyd? Yes, I looked shocking. Mmm, shocking. Back above the Oceanos, one of the engineers in the chopper was motioning for diver Paul Wiley to hurry. Time was running up. He was telling me, hurry up, and I, and I thought, what else could I possibly do? I mean, we couldn't go any faster. The choppers were packing survivors in beyond capacity, but there simply weren't enough seats for the daunting number of people still on the ship. Every time I went from the bow and came back to the main deck, it just, got, it just looked worse and worse. There was just so many folks. On the bridge, magician Robin Boltman was working the radio, keeping a head count and the rescuers informed. When an unexpected voice popped on the line, it was the captain calling from land. So you're on the bridge, I'm on the where bridge. the captain belongs. He's on shore. And he said, uh, uh, Robin, what degree are we listing at now? And I remember saying, what do you mean we? Where are you? At last, the numbers were dwindling. Most of the remaining passengers had paired up for the airlift. But there was one elderly woman who didn't have a partner. Pete beckoned to his son, Peter. I said to him, son, now you're going to have to go because this little lady hasn't got a partner. And he said, no, Dad, I'm not going to go. I said, he didn't want to go he without you. He didn't want to go without me, no. But then all of a sudden he just said, OK, Dad, I'll go. I'll take her up. The old lady grabbed him around the waist and that's where my son was gone. At midday off the wild coast of South Africa, the stricken passenger cruiser Oceanos, like a huge dying animal, was breathing its last. Navy diver Paul Wiley felt it, a shuddering death rattle. I could just sort of hear air leaving the vessel, and I realized, gee, here we go, you know, this is it. From a dinghy, a Navy diver motioned for those remaining on the bow to jump. Magician Julian Butler was standing next to a distraught member of the kitchen staff. He looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, but I can't swim. So I grabbed hold of the, the back of his life jacket and we both jumped together. Cruise director Lorraine Betts followed. I didn't even feel cold. It was fabulous to be off. And then magician Robin Boltman and guitarist Moss Hills joined the tiny remnant still aboard for the final airlift. And the feeling? It was just an immense flood of relief. Now there were two left on the ship. Diver Paul Wiley, passenger Pete Neiman. They searched the corridors below one last time. It seems to me you stopped along the way somewhere, didn't you? Yeah, we stopped there by the pub. We couldn't find a beer, but we were settled with a Coke. <laughs> I was thinking maybe good scotch or something. Well, there wasn't time for that. Paul and Pete strapped each other in, and off they went. And then, as if she had patiently waited, for this very moment, the Oceanos thrust her stern into the air and slid nose first into the sea. Its back rail slipped silently beneath the waves. And the Oceanos, Lady of the Sea, was gone. At the rescue staging ground a few miles down the coast, the mood was celebratory. Chopper after chopper touched down, brimming with blanket-wrapped survivors. When Pete Neiman arrived, he gave his son the biggest hug of his life. I think my son is quite a brave lad because he preferred staying with his dad. Just helping out, give us a hand, make it easier for us. It's my son. 
When the entertainers hit the ground, they received a hero's welcome. Moss, the hero, baby. Absolute hero. Moss Hills was so exhausted, paramedics had to put him on a stretcher and insert an IV. Not everyone was celebrating, however. Karen Winter had a chest full of broken ribs from her ordeal, but still had to endure a pointed reminder of her mother's premonition about the Oceanos. What did your mother say to you after this was over? Oh, my goodness gracious. I told you so. I told you so. I just said, Ma, just don't start now. Please, we all laugh. She said, yes, I know, but you could have saved yourself a lot of trouble if you'd listened to me, you know. <laughs> On the freighter that rescued her, Sandra Palmer had refused to watch the Oceana's final moments. I thought I'd be watching my husband, Les Fedge, drowning in front of our eyes. She had not received word about her husband. And the next day, as survivors converged at the airport in East London, she frantically searched the crowd. Everybody was so happy to, at the reunion, and he wasn't there. And then another flight came in, and there he was. We had all survived. It was wonderful. But then there was Gerda Walton, whose husband George had plummeted into the ocean from an almost certainly fatal height. Had she really lost the love of her life? I hit the water. Everything turned black. In fact, no, she had not. George came to as he surfaced, desperately checking for Gerda. She was just being rolled up into the helicopter. I felt my fingers and my legs. It all felt okay. Nearly burst out into song. Uh, I'm, alive. I'm, uh, I'm alive. <laughs> then I saw this figure coming towards me, and it was Paul Wiley. Navy diver Paul Wiley leapt into action when he saw George fall, diving off the back deck of the Oceanos and into the sea. I swam and suddenly realized there was no chance of finding this guy. There was just too much spray. Minutes went by, and then, there like the needle in the haystack, was George. Now, he was in pretty bad shape, I would say. Thirty hours later, George and Gerda were finally reunited. George had suffered severe internal bruising, but somehow he was alive. What was it like when you finally saw him again? It was wonderful. Although he was hurt and he was in pain, he was alive. It was all that was what matters. Off the coast of South Africa, the cruise ships in South Africa Simpson. continue their investigation into the Sunday, seeking of the Oceanos made news around the world. The most remarkable part of the story? Not a single life had been lost. All 571 souls survived. I couldn't believe it. The press dubbed it a miracle at sea. Lorraine and her staff were instant celebrities, heroes. The Oceanos Greek crew, however, was considerably less fortunate, especially Captain Yanis Avranis, who admitted leaving before some passengers but offered no apologies. When I order a bottom of the ship, doesn't matter what time I leave. A bottom is for everybody. If some people like to stay, they can stay. Captain Avranis declined Dateline's request for an interview. But at the time, he explained his departure this way. He said the lack of communications on board meant he could better run the rescue from shore. Cruise director Lorraine Betts says that while the captain and the ship's officers deserve criticism, other members of the crew actually deserve praise. There were many Greeks who stayed and helped us all night long. In fact, says Lorraine, the legacy of the Oceano should not be about culpability at all, but rather a life lesson that people, no matter who they are, working together can make a miracle. People against all odds can be so amazing. Is that why everybody lived? I think we all have a survival instinct and it showed, it came out, it came through in all of us that night. And so, on a day when seafaring tradition was abandoned, the will to survive and the courage to be selfless turned disaster at sea into one of the greatest maritime rescues in recorded history. It doesn't feel a specifically heroic thing. It just feels like that's how humans should be. If you're in the street and someone stumbles and falls, you're not going to leave them there, you're going to help them. And once you're doing that, you've got to see it through, so we did. 